Traditionally, a lot of botanists who practice as ethnobotanists came out of one of two scientific disciplines. They were either systematists or they were plant anatomists. Uh, today, our presentation is going to be given by Dr. David Webb, who's from the University of Hawaii Department of Botany. And uh, he happens to be a plant anatomist and has worked a fair amount looking at uh, how plant materials uh, are used in the production of traditional crafts and, and uh, all kinds of different, uh, different things. Uh, including houses, which is uh, part of your topic today. Okay, thank, thank you very ready. much. Right. Yes, we're ready to go. Okay. The title of today's talk is What Makes Plants Waterproof and Strong? The purpose of the lecture is to provide some structural information from a botanical point of view on why the plants that were useful for making Hawaiian houses uh, were actually useful. The epidermis is the tissue that covers the entire plant body. It produces a waxy cuticle that repels water. On this page you can see several slides of agave. Now agave was brought to Hawaii as a fiber plant but is seen locally now mainly as an ornamental plant. It's native to very dry habitats like the Sonoran Desert on the mainland. As a result it has a very thick cuticle the cuticle helps to prevent evaporation of water from the internal tissues of the plant and consequently helps the plant to survive. Locally, coconut palm, which is considered to be a canoe plant, occupies very dry, windy, and salty habitats. It also has a very thick cuticle that helps it to retain water and thus survive, but also the leaf then sheds water and that makes it useful as a potential thatching material. Here are two leaf sections taken from coconut palm and they're stained so that the cuticle will stain an orange color. And you can see very clearly that the coconut palm does have a fairly thick and waxy cuticle. On this slide you can see images from the key or tea plant which is in the agave family. It's also considered to be a canoe plant and was thought to have been brought by early Polynesians to Hawaii. It's stained to show that it also has a thick waxy cuticle. The cuticle made it useful for Hawaiians who used it as a thatching but also used it to make rain capes because it would repel water. Peely grass was the most popular material used as a thatching by Hawaiians especially on dry sites like the Kona coast of the Big Island. Notice that the leaf has parallel veins. This probably helps to channel water that hits the surface so that it won't stay on the leaf. It sheds water readily and that makes it useful as a thatching material. Key, which was also used as a thatching material, has a very similar vein pattern. Now this is a cross section through peely grass, uh, through one of the main veins. And I want you to notice the very thick cuticle that appears to be translucent, especially on the upper side of the leaf, emphasizing again the importance of the cuticle uh, repelling water and thus making it a useful material, in this case as a thatching material. Hala is another example of a locally important plant that was used for thatching, and it also has an extremely thick water repelling cuticle. Now the cuticle is virtually indigestible. Fungi and bacteria really can't degrade the cuticle very well. That makes it very durable which is important if you want to use it as a thatch or as cordage because it's going to resist wetting, it'll also resist rotting. As I mentioned earlier, the cuticle does cover the entire plant body, but it's thickest on the leaves, less thick on stems, and is usually very thin on roots. Roots of course are, insol are involved in water absorption where a thick cuticle would get in the way. Now I want to switch from what makes leaves waterproof to what makes leaves strong. Basically it's the veins in the leaves that provide most of the structural integrity for them. 
and the veins contain vascular bundles. Now there are three tissues that comprise vascular bundles. The fibers are most specialized for structural support. These surround the xylem, which conducts water, but also provides structural support. Its cells have rather thick walls. Then the third tissue is the phloem. The phloem provides the least amount of structural support. It conducts sugar. Now the fiber cells, as I mentioned previously, are the most important cells when it comes to providing strength in the vascular bundles of leaves. The fiber cells don't look strong individually. They're rather long and narrow. However, they have overlapping end walls in stems, leaves, and where they're present in roots. And this overlapping of the end walls provides for a lot of structural support. If the cells were lined up end to end like this, it would be very easy for them to break. But when their end walls overlap like this, it's very difficult for them to break and it provides a lot of structural support. It doesn't show it here, but the fiber cell walls are relatively thick compared to their total diameter. So it's the thickness of the wall, their length, and then their overlapping end walls that collectively make them very strong. Okay, here we see an image of ko or sugarcane. This is thought to be another canoe plant. Notice that there are many veins in the leaves, and it's these veins, especially the larger ones, that provide most of the structural support for the sugarcane leaf. And this is typical for a lot of plants like key and sugarcane. This is a three-dimensional diagram of a sugarcane leaf, and again, the diagram emphasizes the many vascular bundles that are present. Now, because the bundles have fibers and vascular tissues in them, they're referred to as fibrovascular bundles. I may use that term in the future, and that's what it means. It simply means fibers combined with vascular tissues. We've seen this slide before. This is a cross-section of one of the major bundles in Peely grass. Notice that this qualifies as a fibrovascular bundle because there are fibers above and below the vascular bundle, but also that surround the xylem and the phloem. Now, this stain stains lignified cells a blue to purple color. Notice that most of the fibers have stained that way, and also that the xylem has stained a blue to purple color. This stains a chemical called lignin. Lignin makes plant cell walls incredibly strong, reputedly as strong as steel. It also makes them water repellent, which is important especially for the xylem. The phloem cells, on the other hand, have stained pink. That means that they don't contain lignin, but the fibers and the xylem do contain lignin. Now, most of the plants we've been looking at so far are classified as being monocots. Monocots tend to have long, narrow leaves like sugarcane or co. These plants have veins that run parallel to one another in the leaf. Key would be another example of this. And this parallel organization of the veins probably helps water to flow off of the leaves. So the local examples that are important for this lecture and for the next lecture are Peely grass, heteropogon, Hala, pandanus, Ko, sugarcane, New, coconut palm, and Uki Uki grass, Dianella. These are all monocots. Here we're looking at a key leaf cross section. I want you to notice the many parallel veins. The largest are fibrovascular bundles, and you should be able to see the abundance of fibers which have stained a blue color in this particular slide. I think you can see that the abundance of fibers associated with these fibrovascular bundles provides a great deal of strength for this leaf. Here we're looking at uki uki grass. You can see also that the leaf has many parallel veins. This provides a lot of strength. Uki uki grass was the source of a very good type of cordage that was used to secure thatch on the typical Hawaiian house. It also has a thick cuticle which would help it to repel water. So here again are these two topics we're talking about topics that, characteristics rather, that provide for strength 
characteristics that repel water present in the same leaf that makes the leaf useful, in this case as a source of cordage rather than as a thatching material. Now I don't want to burden you with too many scientific terms, but I'm going to have to tell you the name of the tissue that is associated with strengthening elements in leaves and stems. It's called sklerinkima. I try to think of it as a brand of Russian vodka. And if you think of it that way, maybe it won't be quite so hard to remember. Sklerinkima. The first part of the word scler means hard. Sklerinkima cells have very hard walls because they're very thick and they usually contain lignin, the chemical that makes the walls extremely rigid and strong. So these sclerenchyma tissues contain sclerenchyma cells called fibers that make up the strengthening element uh, of most plant organs. The cell walls usually contain lignin, which accounts for their strength. But it makes the fibers very coarse and brittle. Consequently, cloth made from fibers would really irritate your skin and make you terrifically uncomfortable. Now, fibers are typically associated with vascular bundles. So far, we've been dealing with monocots. And with most monocots, the fibers go almost completely around the vascular tissues. And we call these then fibrovascular bundles. We'll see that in dicots, for instance, the fibers are associated with vascular tissue, but they're opposite the phloem and don't always go completely around the xylem. Fibers are also important in providing structural support for roots, and we'll deal with EAEA later, in which it's the roots that are useful for house construction. What we see now are two images of Makaloa stems. Now, Makaloa was used to make fine mats, especially for the alii. On the left is a cross-sectional diagram of an intact stem, and you can see the widely dispersed vascular bundles in the stem. On the right-hand side, you can see uh, enlarged fibrovascular bundles. These are similar to what we've seen before, for instance, in, in key, where the fibers go completely around the xylem and flow. This is another monocot. In this case, we're looking at stems. And again, it's the same cells and the same tissue that provide strength in the stems, the fibers. And also, notice that the xylem cells also have stained blue, indicating that they are also lignified like the fibers. And consequently, the xylem also then is providing structural support in these stems. Well, you may notice that we've changed position. Up until this point, we've been talking about monocots. These plants tend to have linear leaves like sugarcane. Now we're going to start talking about dicots. Dicots are broadleaf plants, and the wokade that I'm holding in my hand would be a good example of a dicot. Now, wokade fibers were very useful for making kappa. How is another example of a useful dicot? In the case of how, the fibers in the stem were used to make a type of cordage. Now, in dicots, the fibers are associated with the vascular tissues. They're most strongly associated with the phloem. And consequently, they've been called bast fibers or phloem fibers. They usually don't surround completely the vascular bundles. So the term fibrovascular bundle is most appropriate for monocots, not quite as appropriate for dicots. All right, this slide is split into two images. One image is a diagram of a typical woody stem. The other is a picture of the stem from the how plant. Now, the how stem was stained so that lignified cells would stain a red color. Also, to get this picture, I used polarizing filters. And when you use polarizing filters, cell walls that are very thick appear bright. Cells with thin cell walls appear black or don't appear at all. The fibers in this case are located in what's known as secondary phloem. And so they're phloem fibers. In lay terms, the secondary phloem is called the inner bark. And so, for instance, when fibers of wokay were harvested, people would peel away the bark, and the inner portion of that bark is the secondary phloem. 
and that's where the useful fibers are located. So when I say bark fibers, I'm referring to these fibers from the secondary phloem and the inner bark. Now wood also contains lignified fibers. And you'll notice towards the bottom of the picture, you can see the wood fibers. They, of course, were not useful for making cordage, but of course, the lignin in the xylem makes wood strong, and that's what's used to make the support beams to construct houses. Now, this is a cross-section of the house stem. On the right, you see an overview of the inner bark, and on the left is a close-up of the fibers. Now, the red stain, again, indicates the presence of lignin, and the brightness indicates that these fiber cells have very thick walls. So it's a combination of lignin and thick cell walls that provides the strength for these fibers in the stem. Now this is a view of the inner bark fibers of how. In this case, I've again used the technique of polarized light. On the right, you'll see an overview of the inner bark, and on the left, a close-up of the fibers. Again, the brightness indicates the very thick nature of these cell walls. Also notice that the fibers form a very distinctive pattern. This can be used for identification. In this case, this is a specimen from a Hawaiian artifact that I was asked to identify. And again, I've used the technique of polarized microscopy. Looking at the thickness of the cell walls and the pattern that's present, it's almost certainly a specimen from how. On this slide, we see wake plants on the left and a wake leaf on the right. As I mentioned previously, it's the inner bark from wake that was used to make kapa, which is a type of bark cloth. All right, this is a cross-section of a wake stem. Above is an overview, and below is a close-up of the fibers. Now, in this case, a pink to purple color indicates that the fibers are not lignified. Let me repeat, not lignified. Wake fibers are not lignified. That makes them very soft and makes them appropriate for clothing. So they might not have the strength of the how fibers, but cloth made out of wake fibers would be very comfortable against the skin. Now, the term bast fibers applies to all fibers that are taken from the outer stem. And with wake, then, the bark is peeled from young stems, the inner bark separates from the wood, then it's the innermost layer of that peel that is used to make the bark cloth or kappa. Now this is a specimen of foam kappa from the Bishop Museum. I haven't really followed up on this. Uh, there, the methods for making typical kappa are pretty well known, but some special methodology must have been used to make this rather unusual piece of kappa. All right, fibers from Olana were the strongest fibers that Hawaiians had access to. These were especially useful for manufacturing rope for naval applications. And until the invention of synthetic fibers like nylon, cordage made from Olana was the strongest material available for naval uses. The strength of these fibers comes from the fact that they are incredibly long, much longer than any other fibers. They also have thick walls as well. The walls are made out of pure cellulose. The fibers were so strong that only a few individual fibers were required, for instance, to apply feathers to the capes and to the helmets of the Elihi. And here we see some examples of the use of Olana fibers in capes, helmets, and in also providing the type of cordage that could be used on fish hooks. Here we see some cross sections of Olana fibers. On the left, I've used the polarizing technique again, which shows you how thick the cell walls of the Olana cells were. On the right, the color indicates that these fibers lack lignin. So lignin is not absolutely required to make a strong fiber. These fibers are very strong, and they don't have lignin in them. The absence of lignin makes them very flexible, which would have many benefits considering the way they were used to make fish hooks and also to make thread to apply feathers and so forth. Well, Olanoff fibers are found in the outer part of the stem, like the fibers of Wake and Howe. 
However, they're not really fibers. They're structures called laticifers. Now, laticifers contain latex, which often has a white or milky color. All in all, laticifers are extremely unusual because of their thick cell walls. And it's their thick cell walls that give them their strength. Now, breadfruit, or ulu, is a well-known example of a plant that has laticifers. And if you've ever cut a fruit from breadfruit or cut off one of the leaves, you'll know to stand back because if you don't, you'll get a white shower of latex that comes from the laticifers in Ulu. This is a cross-section of some Olana laticifers. And you can see on the right that this laticifer has an orange material in it. Now, oftentimes, laticifers may have some medicinal value. For instance, the opium poppy. It's the laticifers that produce the opiate derivatives that are useful for pain medication. However, Dr. McClatchy, when he first came here, checked out the Olana laticifers and wasn't able to find any medicinal use for them. Now, as I mentioned, the Olana fiber cell walls are extremely thick, and they're comprised of pure cellulose. Consequently, they're very flexible. Now, it's interesting in that flax fibers also lack lignin and are stronger when they're wet than when they're dry. Now, Olana fibers were well known to be used for naval applications where they would often get wet. It might be very interesting to test the physical properties of Olana fibers to see if they resemble flax in that they might be stronger when they're wet than when they're dry. I don't know whether anyone's ever looked at this or not, but it would be an interesting study. Well, wood obviously makes stems strong. Now, wood is technically called secondary xylem. The xylem cells are the water conducting cells in the roots and in the stems. And they do have thick walls, but they also have large diameters. And while they provide some structural support, the cells in the xylem that provide most structural support are, you guessed it, fibers. So xylem contains fiber cells in addition to the large cells that are called tracheary elements that conduct water. And it's the fibers that provide for the structural support. All right, now we're looking at a cross-section of a typical woody stem. The xylem cells, the conducting cells, are the cells that have a large diameter and thus appear to be white in the center. These are surrounded by narrow, thick-walled fiber cells. Now, both are lignified, but it's really the fibers in the xylem that provide the structural support. This is a close-up. The cells with a large diameter that you can see are the conducting cells in the xylem. These are known as vessels or pores. But you can see these are surrounded by narrower cells, but cells that have thicker walls. And these cells are the lignified fibers then that provide structural support. Here we see two slides from Koa Wood. Once again, the cells with the large diameter are the conducting cells, the vessels or pores. But notice, Koa has mostly fibers in it. And it's the fibers then that give Koa its strength. Now, we don't find too many Koa trees of this diameter anymore. The koa trees, of course, were highly prized and in ancient times were used primarily by the ali'i. When the Hawaii loa was made, many of the components of the Hawaii loa were made from koa. And I was fortunate to be at the Bishop Museum one day when the vessel was on display, and that's where I took these photographs. Metrocedrus polymorpha is the other major forestry species here in Hawaii. And like koa, it was highly prized in ancient times, and its uses were often reserved for the ali'i. The scientific name of Ohia lehua is Metrocedros polymorpha. Here we see a cross-section through the wood of Ohia lehua. And once again, you can see the great abundance of fibers in the wood that contribute to its strength. Now, in the temperate zone, we often see these growth increments or growth rings. These are caused by the annual change in the temperature. And wood is well known to be a primary construction material around the world. As you can see, the same tissue that provides strength to leaves also provides strength to stems. And it shouldn't be surprising that it's the same tissue 
that provide strength to roots. Now we don't look at roots very often and we don't think about them very much because they're underground. Their primary function, of course, is to anchor the plant and also to absorb water. However, some roots have uses, especially in the construction of Hawaiian housing, and that's what we want to talk about next. Okay, in stems, there are two basic patterns for the distribution of vascular tissues. In dicots, illustrated on the left, the vascular bundles are located around the periphery of the stem. In monocots, um, like sugarcane, for instance, on the right, the vascular bundles are distributed throughout the cross section of the stem. In roots, however, the vascular tissues are located dead center in the root then these are surrounded by other tissues called ground tissues and then by the epidermis. The strength in roots is going to come from that central part, the vascular tissue. This is a diagram of a typical fleshy root. And if you go straight to the center of the root where the cells have stained red, this is the xylem. Now the xylem again contains the vessels or tracheary elements and also contains fibers and it's this core of xylem that provides the strength in roots. The surrounding tissues, the phloem and ground tissues and the dermal tissues, really don't provide for much strength. It's all in the xylem. Now, EAEA grows as a low shrub, but when it encounters a tree, it has the ability to climb up the tree and become a vine-like critter. It's able to climb up onto the stem and up into the crown of these trees because it produces very strong roots which grow around the stem and anchor the EAEA stem to the larger plant. These roots are exceedingly strong and as we'll see, Hawaiians found a very good use for them. These are EAEA flowers. On the left we see the female flowers and on right we see the male flowers. Very beautiful plants when they're in flower. Here we see an EAEA plant climbing up the stem of a larger tree. We can see the green leaves above and then the stem below of the EAEA. Here we can see a close-up that shows the EAEA roots as they've grown out from the EAEA stem and completely encircled the stem of this small tree. I've seen trees on the Manoa Cliff Trail where there are more EAEA leaves in the crown of those trees than there are leaves of the tree itself and it's these roots that allow the stems then to climb up into the canopy. This is a cross section through an EAEA root. If you look at the bottom of the slide, that's where we find the xylem. Once again, this is stained so that lignin will stain a red color. We can also see some of the outer tissues, the cortex contains fibers. However, when the roots are processed, the cortical fibers and the soft tissues of the cortex are removed and it's only the inner xylem then that's actually used to produce a type of cordage. All right, this photograph shows the central region of the xylem from an EAEA root. The large cells are the cells that uh, conduct water, but you can see that most of the area is occupied by thick-walled lignified fiber cells that provide the strength for this xylem tissue and this root. Now, the Hawaiians found many uses for EAEA. The lignified fibers uh, resist rotting, and they were useful, for instance, for making fish traps. The Hawaiians also made very beautiful and elegant baskets from these EAEA fibers. Also, the frames that were used to make the helmets, for instance, that were worn by the Ilihi were often made from EAEA roots. The twine that was used to uh, sew the feathers onto the helmets was made from Olana fibers. Finally, I want to talk about the outer part of the plant. We commonly look at this and we call it bark. And I want to distinguish this as the outer bark. To distinguish it from the inner bark, which is secondary phloem and contains bast fibers. Now, the technical term for the outer bark is periderm. Derm refers to skin, and peri means around. In woody stems and roots, the periderm replaces the epidermis and forms the outer covering of the plant. Now, periderm is extremely important. Its cells are very resistant to microbes. 
the cells have no nutrients in them. In fact, they contain chemicals that resist their um, decay by microbes. Also, they prevent water loss, and the periderm has insulating properties to protect stems and roots from extreme temperatures. The photo shows the periderm from the Spanish cork oak. This is the immature periderm. It's not the periderm that's used to make corks for wine, for instance. This is a three-dimensional diagram of a woody stem. In the center is the secondary xylem, and I've colored it red to indicate that the cells in there are lignified. Then there's a layer called the vascular cambium that separates the secondary xylem from the inner bark, or secondary phloem. Outside of the inner bark is where we find the periderm, or cork. This is a cross-section of a Norfolk Island pine just after it had been sawed down. In the center is the wood, or secondary xylem. The light brown region is the inner bark, or secondary phloem, and then the outer bark, or periderm, can be seen. Now, the periderm, or outer bark, really did not have a lot of uses for ancient Hawaiians. Kukui bark was used to make a dye that colored kappa, and noni bark reputedly had some medicinal values, and also it may have been used as a dye for kappa. On the left, we can see a picture of a kukui plant and a noni plant, just for your reference. However, there are some famous applications of bark. Perhaps the most famous is the bark from the cinnamon tree, perhaps the most valued spice in the entire spice trade. This essentially is dried bark. Also, of course, North Americans used birch bark to make their famous birch bark canoes, and these are still made, and you can buy them in the northeastern United States and Canada. Perhaps the most famous bark is the bark from the fever bark tree, Chinchona pubescens. Uh, this is uh, where the drug quinine was extracted from, and of course quinine has been an important drug in treating malaria. And as a slight humorous afterthought, of course, cork is still used to cap wine bottles, although I think it is being replaced by plastic, at least in the wines that I probably could afford to drink.